welcome to this webinar on UK education for high net worth Nigerian families. I'm joined by an expert panel who's going to take us through some of the key considerations across the course of the next hour. Um, as always with our content, we love to have questions and comments from our audience. So if you are watching along, please do uh, put a comment in the chat and I will bring that to our expert panelists as we move through the conversation today. So I'm delighted to be joined um, by three panelists. I'm gonna to come to each of them now for a quick introduction on how they deal with high net worth families in Nigeria and specifically on this aspect of schools and education. So perhaps Mark Brooks, if I could come to you first for a brief intro, welcome Mark. Thanks very much, David, and it's great to be here today. Uh, I've been an educational consultant working with Nigerian families for 15 years, and I've worked with uh, boarding schools for five years before that as a uh, marketing director and a registrar. I, I guess my experience, I did a MBA a few years ago, and that was the, the, the dissertation was on how parents choose an independent school. Uh, just recently, I've been awarded Forbes magazine top 25 boarding school advisor in the world. And just a couple of years ago, I was awarded Department for Business and Trade Export Champion. And I guess I deal and talk with Nigerian families every single day, including Christmas Day. And actually, especially on Christmas Day, we exchange Christmas cards and WhatsApp messages as well. So my 99% of my work is helping families from Nigeria find boarding schools in the UK and day schools in the UK. Super. Well, look, thanks to, thanks for uh, joining us today. Uh, Akin Koka from Buzzacott. Buzzacott are sponsoring this session today. Akin, it would be great to hear about your interest in this field and how you work with clients in this area. Thanks, David. Uh, yes, yeah, so my name is Akin Koka. I'm head of private clients here at Buzzacott, and I've been advising international families on tax matters for believe it or not, over 30 years now. Um, and I, I suppose a really interesting twist for me is that uh, I ended up being born in the UK as a result of my father uh, coming to the UK to study. So different circumstances, in his case, obviously coming as an adult. But uh, yeah, so people have been coming to the UK for a very long time. But the UK tax regime is a very complex regime. The uh, highest rate of income tax is 45%. Uh, and we have a system of self-assessment, which puts the onus on the taxpayer to get it right. Uh, and that means that there's a lot of planning that needs to be done in terms of thinking about residents and funds needed and acquisitions of properties. And you know, we um, have advised uh, many families and continue to advise families on how best to maximize that and minimize uh, exposure to UK tax. Thank you, Akin. We'll get into some of the detail on that shortly. And our final guest, uh, Bimpei Nkotchu from uh, WA Advisory. Welcome, Bimpei. Hello. Um, thank you, David. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And um, welcome to the session today. My name is Bimpei Konchu. I'm managing principal and founder of W8 Advisory, which is a wealth management boutique practice in, based in London, um, but obviously it's focusing very much on African families, especially Nigeria, because I'm from Nigeria. Uh, I'm a Nigerian and UK qualified lawyer for over 30 years. And my work really is um, supporting families in everything to do with wealth planning, structuring their assets, um, especially around estate planning ensuring a conflict-free transfer of wealth to the next generation. But obviously in the families, during the family's lifetime of the lifetime of the um, parents or the uh, patriarch or whoever's earning the money, uh, there's important work to do around investments. And one of the key investments is investing in your children's education. So it always comes up in conversation around, as a family office advisor, the best school, uh, but obviously how to plan for it, how to afford it, how to ensure that, you know, the money is well spent and how to also sort of, I would say, hedge against the vagaries of all the, um, I would say, the hostile environment in, in the Nigerian domestic economy that can actually affect a parent's ability to pay. So that's my work is advising and supporting and family wealth creation and preservation. Fantastic. Well, look, great to have you uh, with us today. Um, Mark, just coming to you first, you, you're fresh from a, a two-week trip to Nigeria, perhaps you could give us a flavour of the activity that you undertook over the last two weeks and any observations you made about 
latest trends and demand from families in Nigeria? Thanks very much, David. You know, I've spent two weeks in Abuja and Lagos just recently, and I was running two boarding school exhibitions, and I took 17 boarding schools from the UK. And I think two takeaways from that um, is boarding schools in the UK are more popular than ever before from Nigerian families, and we can talk about that later. Mm. But the second point is that we're very keen to establish partnerships with schools in Nigeria as well, because they're fantastic schools. And they're wide open to support and exchange, teacher exchange. We ran some seminars for teachers as well. So it's a two-way traffic in terms of the education flow. Um, some of the highlights were that we took the team to a radio station. So we had eight primetime radio interviews reaching over 10 million audience and two TV interviews reaching more than 20 million audience as well. But I, I think... Uh, uh, the same message goes as, as always, um, education is the number one priority for families and the, the knowledge of British boarding schools is very high. Uh, and the main thing is getting the timing right, applying early and getting the uh, application process together and support and all of that. But we, we just really had a fantastic time and the team who had not been to Nigeria just came away buzzing and want to return again. And most of them are booked to come back in October for the next event. And you've been a frequent visitor to Nigeria over the years. I mean, how many how many trips have you made in total, do you think? Um, well, I've filled my passport now. So my, my visa um, page is completely full. I don't have a spare stamp spot on my visa. So I've got a five year, I've been coming 15 years and I've got a five year visa. And my, uh, I think I must have been at least 60 times. Um, I, I travel every couple of months. So I'm back at the end of June and then September, October and December. Fantastic. And give us a flavour of the type of schools that you were travelling with out, out recently. Is it from, from the length and breadth of the UK, from focus on different age ranges? And what's the type of uh, schools that travelled out with you? wanting to meet families on the ground? That's a great question. The, the profile of the schools is varied because the, the children are varied and the parents are varied as well. So it's something to match everybody. I think uh, there's schools that are very well known, brand, brand household names like mm. Dunn College, Badminton, etc. There are schools that are less well known, but are equally brilliant and offer fantastic value. They might be in Devon or Suffolk or uh, other places. Uh, so they're the kind of traditional boarding school, but there's a real trend to um, go to sixth form college as well in the UK and move at sixth form because there are fantastic schools in Nigeria, but sometimes people um, struggle to find a post-16 answer as well. So um, people come across for um, A-levels, international baccalaureate, or even one-year programme as well. But that might just help them prepare for university. So they might just be really finishing their studies. They don't have to necessarily come at a younger age as a boarder. No, I mean, the profile change. Some parents want a traditional boarding school that would be a household name that they went to themselves and they went to a girls' school or a boys' school. For example, um, Harrow, I've got two students into Harrow this September, as an example, into year nine. But other parents are less... Um, selective and want to choose the right school for their child. Um, I mean, in, in summary, I placed 70 students this year and worked with about 50 different schools altogether. So that's a kind of widespread. And, and I guess the point there is that I really work hard to understand the ambitions of the parents, ambitions of the children, and match the right school to the right child. So it's not mm. just an academic profile, but what their values are as parents, what their ambitions are, and the kind of profile of the school matching the profile of the parents, which is really important, because it, it, it's not just a kind of paper exercise, it's really understanding the philosophy of what the parents are looking for and what their values are. And um, what are you observing in terms of choice between boarding and, and day school options? I mean, boarding school has been your focus, but what could you say about how you're noticing families making decisions about moving to the UK as a family? Well, there's 1,500 Nigerian students in British boarding schools at the moment, but over the last six to nine months, I felt uh, discovered a trend for families wanting to move across um, completely themselves to relocate to London or elsewhere near a school and near work. And so families are approaching me and, and saying, 
you know, we're moving to London or Southwest London, can you find a day school near, near where we're going to be living? Or even more frequently, they're saying, well, we want a school in the Southwest or M4 corridor or Southeast. We can go anywhere within two hours, an hour and a half of London. We want to choose the first day school that appeals to us first, and then we'll relocate after that. And so I suppose that might be working with younger children, because if the family's sticking together, then the family might be more comfortable uh, than, than sending younger children to, to board. Or what, what do you find about the sort of the age in which, the minimum age, as it were, in which families are looking at, at boarding school options? Um, it tends to be sixth form or year nine, age mm. 13. But at the moment, I was talking to a mother on Friday who's sending her very bright child to the UK as soon as possible at year seven, so age 11, for boarding school as well just really wants to be stretched academically and is very keen on football and wants a career in football as well. So we found a football school and uh, so it, it varies a lot, really. But I think, um, no, it, it varies, really. And, and why do you think families choose the UK for education? I mean, the brand of UK education is strong internationally. You work, though, with schools in Switzerland and elsewhere as well. So how do you see, what do you see, you know, for the, the unique thing about what we can bring in the UK in terms of education? Yes, there's lo lots of reasons for that. And a friend of mine wrote a PhD thesis on it, which I won't read out to you now, but <laughs> I, guess, I guess some of the high, very interesting PhD, but um, some of the highlights is um, I re re interviewed some parents recently. And the first thing I guess is high quality of academic standards, which is consistent across the board. The schools in Nigeria are brilliant, but the consistent uh, UK is the gold standard of education. Um, and so one parent said they wanted a foundation of a first class education for their child, which I think kind of summarizes it. And, and the parent also said, British public schools have been doing this for centuries long. And one school I've been working with um, has been doing it 1,300 years. So they're very experienced at, at what they're doing. And, uh, the father said they want a confident, independent adult to come out of it and a broad based international education. I think it leads me to the second point is that um, a lot of uh, business contacts and business world now is an international world, as we're experiencing today. And you experience with HNW Advisor and PCG Club. It's an international world now. And so to give exposure to uh, an education with 40 or even 65 other nationalities it really helps students to understand a how parents think how, how students think the mindset of different cultures but to also get networks and contacts for business beyond really um, the other reason that families choose British boarding schools is a well-rounded education so it's not just academic results which is a, a given in a sense but it's also um, the acres of playing fields, fantastic facilities for sports, drama, music, um, creativity, photography, all of those areas with, with facilities that are kind of world standard that you don't get elsewhere. And that's an attraction for students from all, all across the world, not just Nigeria. Right. Um, and given you've been working for such a long time with families in Nigeria, do you have examples that come to mind of Nigerian students who've been a success, settled in, you know, enjoyed the whole uh, experience of coming to UK, uh, to boarding schools in the UK. Yes, yeah, lo lots of student experiences. And it, one student uh, has become a property lawyer, in intellectual property lawyer in Lagos, and as a result of studying in, in the UK for a couple of years in sixth form and GCSEs. And uh, his quote, which I, I took down the other day, um, he, he said uh, the school was a pivotal moment in my life. Uh, they're excellent in teachers and advisors, which helped me to settle down. But he said he, he found it annoying, one aspect of the school, is how regularly my parents received updates from my schoolwork, <laughs> which is quite <laughs> common. Uh, and the, the number one priority is not just education, but uh, weekly reports on children's progress. And he said he hated it at the time, but he thought it was very good. And it helped him with discipline. And he said, it's an education that suited my every child. My family still cherishes the time I spent at the school. And another story I heard just recently as well, just on Thursday, in fact, was a student who'd studied um, at, at, at a college in the UK, A-levels and all, all those areas. And she um, 
graduated to uh, an American university, which is a very fantastic stepping stone as well, and a very popular stepping stone for Nigerian families from UK boarding school to American universities. And she's just uh, returned to Oxford uh, as a PhD student. And she's doing research on COVID and immunology and kind of curing the world's diseases. And she's she uh, sent a quote to the school that I know saying, that uh, the style of teaching at, um, at the school was uh, kind of set her up for life and set her up for studies at an American University in Oxford as well. Fantastic. We've but, got a short video, actually, which we can play, Mark, that you shared with me, uh, which just, in the own words of a student, gives a little bit of insight. We're just going to load that up and play this short clip now. I feel like this school is really supportive, especially the teachers. So I do IB and it's six subjects, lots of coursework. We have an, a 4,000 word extended essay. We have so many things to do and it's just the way the teachers care and the way they lend the hand to you any anytime you ask. And being the head girl of the school, I, I like, I've seen how much the management is invested in supporting like pe people of all genders, all races, all sexualities like everyone from every single like scope and everything they're like interested in and it's just really nice to feel like there are people that are rooting for you people that are supporting you and people that will be there for you irrespective yeah great to hear from a student in their own words i mean what was the, what was the school that was in the shop there it looked looked fantastic school building and tell us a little bit more about that student well, well i think uh, every school is like a stately home in fact so that's one of the uh, it's a school called box hill school in surrey which offers the a level and ib and she's a student who joined in the sixth form and has absolutely thrived and i think what we, we all had goosebumps when i filmed that it's like my goodness you're going to go a very long way but she's typically typical of a Nigerian student. Uh, the 17 schools we took to, to Nigeria just recently, they all said they've either currently got or recently had a Nigerian head boy or head girl because they're so hardworking, so ambitious, brilliant, at multi-talented, brilliant, brilliant things and real ambassadors for themselves, their parents and the country as well. Right. So, and you mentioned on the top preparation being important, looking down the line and why preparation is important. Perhaps you could like set out how far in advance people should be thinking about this to make preparations to, for an optimal uh, school placement search. Well, to give you an example, if I talk in year groups uh, for um, schools such as Harrow, it, it was four years in advance of them joining the whole process. So preparing them for the year six pre-test preparing them for various entrance tests, coaching for interviews, it took a very long time. Um, and certainly a couple of years in advance is, is great because the process is, when we work with families, is to kind of review, review the child's progress, do the report and understand their profile and what they're looking for, but also have Zoom conversations between them and the school, joint meetings, um, so we do a long list of maybe a dozen schools and then short, shortly this to about five schools that you'd visit over the next few months or six months. And then you start the application process. So it's a kind of long list and short list process uh, that we help families with. And the, the testing process is quite uh, straightforward. You don't have to come to the UK for the tests anymore as well. They're done on Zoom and observed on Zoom or the local British Council. But the the longer the lead time you give it, the um, more chance you have to get into the more selective schools. Saying that, I'm still getting applications for this September, and uh, I was talking to a mother over the weekend who's um, transferring school for this September, and so we're contacting schools today to see what places are available, and I'm sure we'll get her a very good school as well. So we've, we've placed about 35, 40 families already for this September, we're expecting another 20 or so over this between now and the summer and start of term so you, you can never start too early but you can never start too late as well so. <laughs> fantastic and, and then also on the fee point we're going to chat with Bimpe on financial planning for payment of fees but from, from your side I mean how much do you see fees costing how do you see parents planning and paying for for fees 
Well, well, the mother uh, talked to who had a talented footballer and a very bright son have been planning for the last three years. So planning since she was, uh, the son was about six years old. Um, but um, to, to be fair, most people uh, pay out of income as well as savings as well. And I think that's common in the UK as well. Um, so in terms of fee payment, it's best to try and pay it a year in advance because it helps the visa process. Um, but also saying that we do help families with scholarships as well and bursaries because a lot of families um, have very bright children and British schools love having Nigerian students in their schools so we can help them with scholarships as well on academic or sports or other areas too. Um, so it's best to plan as early as you possibly can uh, because of exchange rates and fees going up and fee increases and things but some parents pay out of income as well. So. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Mark, so much for getting our conversation uh, underway. Uh, Akin, just coming to you, I mean, one of the themes there from Mark on the education side was obviously making plans early. And on the tax side, that's also equally um, true. I mean, perhaps you could set out some of the areas on which you'd be working with families based on the, on the sort of scenarios that, that Mark was discussing. Yeah, so I suppose first of all, on on the point of of planning, <clears throat> I think it's every tax advisor's dream uh, to have clients who um, kind of know what they want to do and come and have a chat with you before they actually do it. Um, and you know that is certainly relevant, um, you know, for families, um, you know, with children coming to the UK. And uh, I suppose there are discussions around, um, you know, who is coming. So if it's a young child, um, you know, will one of the parents be moving with the child? And if that's the case, um, you know, how much time are they planning to spend in the UK? Um, uh, you'd need to think about, you know, whether you were trying to spend um, it, enough time to not be UK residents. Um, so that requires planning, an explanation as to how many days you can spend in the UK. But if you were planning to become a UK resident, um, then that also requires planning. Um, so what are the sort of things you need to think about if you're going to be UK resident? Well, when do you actually want to trigger UK residents? Um, is the timing that, through the year because we've got this curious tax year that doesn't line up to the calendar year? So the how do you see that yeah, playing right. out in practice? <laughs> yeah, so you know, if, knowing that the tax year starts on the sixth of April at least gives you that opportunity of you know shifting your date uh, to the extent that that's possible and cutting out um, you know a tax year and avoiding all of the the pain of looking to see whether split year treatment applies. So it can be quite complicated and with a bit of planning, sometimes you can remove you know, whole layers of complexity. But um, you know, if you're going to be UK resident, it leads to questions of um, you know, what are you going to be doing? Are you going to be working in the UK? So one of the, um, the things that we've got now since uh, COVID is this ability for people to work anywhere they want. Mm. And and so we're seeing more parents now who are able to live in the UK but carry on um, earning an income outside of the UK. Um, but that has lots of tax implications in the UK, um, particularly if you need the money in the UK. So in the early years of UK residence, you can, even though you are technically taxable on your worldwide income, um, you may be able to get around that by claiming what we call the remittance basis, which means that you simply pay tax on your foreign income if you bring it into the UK. But, um, you know, if you needed the money in the UK or needed funds in the UK, it's possible to plan and organise your tax affairs so, such that the funds that you bring into the UK are not taxable. But all of this requires pre-planning it's really difficult to do it if you're here and you know you've mixed up all of your funds and then you suddenly decide uh, I need some money 
So with the right planning, becoming resident itself is not necessarily an issue as long as that is tackled in advance. It's very possible to live very tax efficiently in the UK. That's great. Well done. Okay, that's interesting. And have you observed the same trend as with Mark saying he's noticing more families actually wholesale looking to come to, to live in the UK, not just to send children for education? Would you say that's been something you've been seeing too? Yes, um, that, that's certainly um, a, a new trend where in the past it used to be one spouse uh, with you know various family members coming and going. But what we're seeing now is families move into the UK um, and and typically they will uh, you know, be looking to buy a property in the UK as well. And, and on the property uh, front, um, there's been lots of changes going back now, many, many years, last 10 years in, in the UK. Um, but for foreign owners wanting to buy UK property, the position is now more complicated than it was. I mean, when you've got someone, family looking at sending children to the UK and wanting property in the UK, what are some of the tax considerations that you talk through with them about that asset? Well, the, the two major changes, uh, there have been lots of changes over the years, but two major changes are for capital gains tax, which is the tax that's paid on the gain when the property is disposed of, and inheritance tax. And I'll just talk briefly about the capital gains tax first. So um, going back to pre-2015, I believe, um, you could own a, a UK pro um, property and then at some point maybe become non-resident or maybe they never became resident in the first place. And that disposal, uh, so the gain on that disposal wasn't taxable for non-resident owners. But now that is no longer the case. And so whether they are resident or not, um, if you own a UK property, the, the disposal of that property is going to be taxable. And in fact, there, um, there's a tight window for reporting. You've got 60 days to wrap up all of, all of the reporting. And so that leads to, um, I suppose, a need to plan around you know, the ownership of that property to, you know, in a way that will mitigate your exposure to capital gains tax. And then similarly for inheritance tax, it used to be possible to um, structure the acquisition via an offshore corporate, typically, um, such that that property would not be subject to inheritance tax. And again, those rules have been changed now. And so um, there's still many people um, who just know that historically properties have been bought through companies. And so they're still um, trying to buy these properties through the corporates, but that may not be the, the best thing to do now. And particularly as the um, inheritance tax advantage is gone, um, it may still be possible or, advantageous to buy a property through a corporate but that would be for completely different reasons and i, I suppose to sum it up there's no um, sort of right or wrong way it really will depend on the individual circumstances of each family it will depend on things like who's using the property um, how much leveraging there is um, the succession plans and things like that but we can look through work through those circumstances and choose the most appropriate structure for the family. Okay, thank you. And you mentioned um, before those spending more time in the UK and perhaps running commercial enterprise then from the UK. What, what are some of the implications of that if someone was running a business spending a lot more time in the UK? Well, if it's a UK business, then I, I think that's well, straightforward in the sense that you would have to obviously go through all of the UK compliance and, and pay your tax um, in the UK like, like everyone else. Where it gets very complicated and what is probably a more likely scenario, particularly in terms of um, the clients we've seen recently, is they um, are carrying on a business um, that was set up in Nigeria. Um, and, and really the money is being made in Nigeria, but they are spending a considerable amount of time in the UK, um, such that they're UK residents. And that's where we get into um, this whole um, thing about um, 
UK residents and what that means. So if you are UK residents, the starting point is you're taxable on your worldwide income, but you can in the first few years claim what we call the remittance basis. And that means that if you don't bring the money to the UK, uh, you won't have to pay tax on it. But be, uh, so if you think about the fact that people will have other wealth um, in Nigeria um, and they have income, then lo logically you would say, well, I'll, I'll bring my other wealth that's not income so that I don't have to pay tax on it, except that the UK have very uh, complex rules. So if you make a remittance from a bank account that has income in it and other funds that we wouldn't consider to be income, we have rules that decide what you've brought to the, to the UK. And those rules will say you've brought the income first. Unless, of course, you plan your affairs. So you can sort out your, your finances into different pots, which will enable you to bring funds to the UK that are not taxable. And I suppose if you were thinking about pre-arrival planning, then again, you'd be looking to bring the funds to the UK before you became UK resident, again, to avoid um, having to pay tax on them. OK, thank you. And then to Mark's point about uh, Nigerian students coming over to the UK and creating fantastic new networks in the UK and, and internationally. Is this is this something that you see with those who come for education here, end up staying, starting businesses or or working for high profile companies in the UK? Is, is the fact that people come here for education and they quite often do end up staying, contributing to our economy and perhaps reinvesting also back the other way into Nigeria off the back of their success? Oh, yes. And as I started by saying, I, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm a living uh, testimony to that, which is how I've ended up here in the first place. But yes, I mean, I, we're certainly seeing um, uh, lots of young people staying. I, I think the world is shrinking anyway. Uh, the world is a much smaller place. And uh, I don't think people are phased uh, by you know, the travel, the distance in the way they used to be. And so we're seeing lots of, uh, sort of young um, Nigerian professionals who've come here for education, staying, setting up businesses, doing very well. Um, some of them taking those businesses um, back to Nigeria, setting up um, sort of branches in Nigeria. And we're also seeing people come the other way, um, sort of young people who maybe have been to school here, gone back, set up businesses, and again, come back and, and set up branches in the UK. Super. Well, that's great to hear. Thank you for that. Um, just a reminder, there is uh, plenty of time to ask questions to our panel. Do put a comment or question in the chat. I'm, I'm actively looking uh, for those to bring up to our panellists. But Bimpe, uh, welcome to you uh, again. Um, it'd be great to just focus in on some of the, the financial planning aspects of uh, saving for education. I mean, how might you support families with the goal of sending children to school overseas, either in the UK or, or elsewhere? Um, yes, definitely. This is um, like um, Aki has alluded to, and Mark has said, it's a global village. This, you know, people expect international families of wealth, expect that their younger generation should have the best opportunity to be educated, to network, to meet people, to learn different cultures, um, because that's you know, the only way to succeed and hopefully even in increase the family's wealth from generation to generation. So that's always a discussion. Now, um, of course, the UK is, you know, the primary destination for Nigerian families. I, I also came here just for A-levels of two years and then went back to that university. And um, you know, Akin and I were actually at the same uni in Nigeria, although we, we didn't find each other until many years later. So, so yes, I benefited very much from having spent two years in sixth form and then coming back here to live by accident um, sort of marriage, uh, realizing that, that those two years I spent here really, really set me up for the ability to live and work and be integrated and I've been bringing up my children here. Now, as a, as a destination, the UK is premium, uh, it's globally recognized, not just by Nigerians, but by families from all over the world. And, but it is an investment, um, of course, Nigerian families who bring their children here are not UK resident when they when they start that journey. So they're looking for the best, and often they have to pay 
for the best. Mm. Um, I mean, UK families probably get an opportunity to use a state system where there are various some very good schools. But if you're coming out from, if you're not a UK taxpayer, you have to pay for the education. Mm. Now, the current data shows that the average cost of um, independent schools, and we call them independent schools, we call them public schools, even though they are not publicly funded. Um, the average average cost per year for a day school is about seventeen thousand five hundred pounds. Uh, that's an eye watering amount, especially when you convert that to naira. And in in, in uh, for boarding schools, the average cost is thirty six thousand a year. Now, both figures and do not include the school uniforms, do not include the extracurricular activities, the school trips to far flung destinations, mm. whether for geography or history of art or you know and all of that. And again, doesn't include the, the airfare, because obviously the child or children fly back and forth for Easter holidays, for Christmas holidays, for summer vacation. Doesn't include the airfare of mom and dad showing up for, you know, um, egg, um, egg, egg seat weekends for sports days. And I know that many of the schools, the public schools these days, the in fee paying schools actually encourage children to go home at weekends. Um, so there is that re the reason why, like Akin was saying, many families end up having a home here, buying a home, and and actually one parent or both being available uh, because they, the the schools here do encourage international families to be around and not sort of you know leave their children and go off and leave them for thousands of miles away. So there is all of the costs, like I said, the implication is to be considered. And when I'm um, working with families, when I take on clients and we're looking at what they're goals are, and of course, the children's education is one of their goals, we start to talk about when, how, what, when they want to do this, when they want the child to go, how do they intend to fund this? The planning is very important. Now, even for university, because I do know that some families only send their children here for uni. Again, for undergraduate studies, a foreign student um, who's not a UK resident is paying anything from 20 to 30,000 pounds. Um, for undergraduate and for postgraduate is about 15 to 20,000. Again, and you know, undergrad is three years, for four years, five years, even if it's medicine. Same with the postgraduate, it could be one or two years. So, like I said, th those figures are I watch really high, both in Sterling, but even more so in Naira, especially with the unfortunate valuation of the currency, which we've seen being quite aggressive in the last six to 12 months. So, what do we talk about? We talk about like I said, when. Mm. And of course, like Mark said, the earlier the planning starts, the better. Um, that's very key. I mean, and so, you know, if your child, if you have, you know, you have children who are age three to four to five and you're starting to think that this is something you want to do, that's the best time to think about it. And you might not even identify the school yet, but at least you need to think of the costs and, you know, do the research and start putting the money away. So the planning because you need um, that compounding, this, don't you? Because the time horizon is just is absolutely. crucial. Absolutely, financial planning is yeah. key. And um, you know, I've had it. You know, I had to chat with Mark, and I do know some families who sometimes, even when they have the naira, even when they're earning, and these families of wealth, you know, own businesses, the ability to access the sterling to pay the school fees can be quite difficult. And I know Central Bank has, you know, it keeps, keeps restricting the amount. And apparently the amount that you can actually source at the official exchange rate currently, something like 4,000 pounds a year mm. a child. And as I just said, just the annual fee uh, school fees for boarding school is about 30. So sourcing the foreign exchange is, is quite crucial. And that's why I tend to um, work with families to say, say, why don't you start putting that money away in hard currency, in sterling or dollars? Why don't you, um, you know, if you usually we're talking about families who are, you know, affluent families and therefore they have access to bank accounts in the UK. Why don't you start saving that money in hard currency, mm. changing the money as and when and putting it away and planning right ahead? So the main thing is start planning early, determine your budget. And like I said, it could be that your child is three or four and, you, and we don't know, you know, 10 years ago, maybe it was 10,000 a year, but you've got to, it's, it's a moving target. But I don't think it changes. And Mark might tell us whether the changes have been that drastic. But if you're putting away, I did some quick calculations just to give you an idea. 
If you were to start investing, say, um, and put it, putting into an investment portfolio, minimum of a thousand pounds a year today, a thousand mm. pounds a month. I'm sorry, a thousand pounds a month, not a year, a thousand pounds a month today. And if you are lucky to sort of see a consistent return of say seven percent returns, yeah, and with compound interest, because obviously the idea is that your your the bank will reinvest the the, the returns on the account. With compound interest, a thousand pounds a month at seven percent would give you one ninety one thousand mm. pounds. That's in ten years, mm. and of course, this is a minimum. So I you know let's even say you if you have three children, perhaps you need to have three different. Um, pots of money in 15 years it's with compound interest at seven percent and of course the market doesn't might be ten percent today might be four percent tomorrow but averaging seven to seven percent uh in 15 years you get four or eight thousand pounds in 20 years you get seven hundred and thirty five thousand pounds that's a thousand pounds a month over 20 years invested at seven percent so the point I'm trying to make here is you've got to do it long term. It's got to mm. be consistent. And of course, some family wealth families may have that huge lump sum. But I think if you've got that pot growing, then even if you do come up out having a lump sum available easily, then it's a bonus. It's something it's, it's a surplus to your needs. But it's very important these days, especially to do this saving and investing in pounds in the currency in which you intend to spend. It's super, super crucial to do that. And in terms of how that's invested also, I mean, will it be with a long time horizon, you know, global equities? I mean, you know, fixed income is paying a certain amount of, of return. But, you know, how would you see it if people have got a long time horizon? How do you help them decide where to invest? It, it used to be. And I'm, I mean, I've been doing what I, I do now. I mean, I ran a law firm for about 18 years and now my wealth management company has been on for about 10 years so I, I have been advising some families for over 20 years and it used to be that real estate was the mm. you know 10 years ago real estate was the first best place to put your money in the UK because we were seeing a uh, very aggressive capital appreciation especially mm. if you write buy in the right postcode we're seeing very good rental income because in fact if you bought the property and you did you weren't ready to come to the UK but you bought it knowing that at least you're renting it, the rental income, we're seeing 5 to 6% returns. Those were the days before 2017, when the UK government, like I can alluded to, uh, decided to change the goalposts, move the goalposts, especially around the cost of the transaction. So it's now very expensive. The stamp duty has gone up. There's something called that you, you actually pay a 3% levy, increased stamp duty on a property if it's your second home. Of course, mm-hmm. most people have a home elsewhere. So if you're buying property in the UK and you already have a home in Nigeria, you're going to pay 3% higher. So increased stamp duty, all the things I can just mentioned about you know, capital gains tax and it has, has made it less attractive. But there are people who started investing in property 10, 15 years ago. And when they're selling it now, they're, that, that, they're, there's their school fees for the, for mm-hmm. the five, 10 year period. So real estate was one, and I think it's was still something to be considered very carefully. But the more, I think the easier option is talking to a bank, um, investment um, management house, and putting aside uh, you know, funds to put into mutual funds, um, ETS, diversified portfolios, to be honest, because we've seen the last year equities, everything <laughs> really went crazy last year, to be honest. But I mean, equities tend to be higher risk. So if you're looking at investing long-term, like you just mentioned, Mark David, fixed income, um, government bonds tend to give you almost a guaranteed return of that seven to eight to nine percent. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing I will touch on, I mean, apart from obviously, like I said, investing, saving, in some cases, and Mark has alluded to the fact that you can sometimes get some financial aid. Um, so, you know, I know some schools, not many, will, will you know, the TV chat, some schools reserve, reserve places for very, very bright children um, who can be what they call um, scholars and who they, they actually, the school decides to pay all or part of their tuition or some, some contribution. So that's something, again, someone like Mark would be well placed to advise on that. Um, and, and just quickly going back to the investment products in the UK, um, some of the banks, and I think many of the people on this call might be people who bank in the UK. If you're thinking of starting early, um, some banks like Barclays, HSBC, actually offer school fees investment plans. And these are plans that are structured, like I said, with a long-term view, long-term goal. 
And, you know, you can actually start putting the money away in, in those sort of plans. And exactly the other thing is you could do a junior ISA, but ISA is, in, is a tax-free investment savings account uh, where you start putting the money away in the child's name and you can put up to, I think it's 9,000 a year in, in the child's name. And, you know, that could help you if you suddenly become tax resident. If you set up a junior ISA or set up a private pension and start putting money into a private pension, which if you then take the money out, in the UK is tax free. So there are certain things you can do um, to mitigate tax exposure if you decide uh, be, to become tax resident and do it, but doing it early before you start is, is, is essential. Um, so plan, plan, and plan again. That's my Thank message. you. Akin, can I just come to you for a quick view on, on using real estate as part of the planning? Do you see people buying investment property in the UK with this kind of planning in mind? And as Bimpe said, L the London market has cooled off a lot, but the regions. UK regions have become more popular for international investors. I mean, what do you see across the desk in terms of the link between real estate investment and trying to finance education costs? I, I think there's there's a, there's always been a link, and um, I I don't see. Yes, I mean maybe what's changed is um, you know the choice of properties given the you know the, the value of the properties, and also um, you know the exchange rate of the Naira, but um, the trend for buying property hasn't stopped at all. Um, and um, in fact, if anything, we, we see that um, you know, if people can, they, they'll buy more than one property. So there will be a home uh, and uh, an investment. Okay, thank you. And then, if I could actually yeah, add to that. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, yes, absolutely. I mean, I have had clients who I say I have three children and I'm buying three properties and, and I'm, I'm buying them. The children are barely five years old, but with a plan that this will fund the school fees of each child in 10 you know, two years time. And it, those have been very successful at the time that they were done. So that's something that's worth thinking about. Thank you. There's a question here, uh, Bimpe, that I'm going to ask you in the chat, just on uh, how, how the changes to the visas by the Home Office affected families moving across to the UK. How's the change in visa affected demand? The changes, to be honest with you, at the moment, there seems to be uh, post-Brexit. If you're thinking about it right now, today, there, there are a few more options than there were before um, for families who want to move because there's been a, there's obviously, a, you know, a Brexit, uh, in, the impact of Brexit on the UK uh, sort of job market and, and, and availability of personnel has meant that, you know, there are more jobs. I think at the time, six months ago, there were more than a million vacancies. So they are, the UK government had introduced, and although I know that they're looking at shutting them down, different options. So, for example, there was something called a Global Talent Visa. And the Global Talent Visa was available to families, um, to you know, someone who would come into the UK um, and would be able to their skills or their, or their entrepreneurship or something that would actually be of value to the UK economy. So that's, that's one area in which... I know a lot of um, parents, um, father and mom, have been able to get a visa to come and settle in the UK. And those are families who have decided to bring their young children here to day school and, and kick off you know, living here and, and wanting to stay on for later. So, I mean, they, that, that's, that's that visa. Now, the options for the student themselves, obviously the student visa is still there. I think it's called the tier four student visa. It's still there. Marcus, obviously, will, I'm sure will advise you the fact you, you do need to show that you're financially able to support the child's education and all of that, and, and there's English language proficiency tests and admit to criteria for the child to get the student visa. Um, but then if the child is educated here for, say, up to 10 years, there's a long stay visa at that child. So if the child comes at the age 11 um, or even age 10, at, at, you know, 10 years later when they're finishing A-levels, uh, they would be definitely be um, entitled to the long stay visa, which gives them the indefinite leave to remain and work in the UK, which is a route to the British passport. Um, but, but then there's also, you know, the, something called a tier five, a government authorized visa, which some students find that they finish studying, they haven't quite hit 10 years, but they want to stay on and work. And there are certain um, categories of um, so professional qualifications that require working, architecture, law, you know, medicine, there are quite a few of those. So if your child is in that category, typically they can easily apply for an extra year or two to work uh, as, and show that it's part of their professional training. 
and and so and that's so that's again and then those are the kind of people who would end up staying here because perhaps they do that training with a firm or a company who then wants to retain them because yes Nigerians often are very hard working and they tend to you know give more than have the average and then you end up getting a job with that company and staying on and that company will then sponsor your work visa and and and, and you know and that's an entry to the UK Thank system. You. Mark, did you have something? Yeah, just, just to confirm uh, what Bimpe and Akin said, um, firstly, it's very useful to get uh, British resident, residency because sometimes schools, you pay British fees rather than international fees, and that can suddenly make a big difference, especially if you have property in the UK to provide surety against fee payment, uh, and that can make quite a few thousand pounds a term difference. The second point to confirm Bimpei's point as well is to, um, if, if you have British residency after 10 years, then you pay home student fees at university as well, um, instead of international student fees. And that's mm. a significant difference. So another advert to start planning early, you can never plan too soon because the financial rewards uh, rack up very quickly. The third, point, the third point I wanted to add, we've talked about Oxbridge students and uh, high achieving students going to be intellectual property lawyers, but also um, there's a very broad intake of students in British boarding schools. And sometimes schools are chosen because they offer help and support with learning support and uh, those who have dyslexia, dyscalculia and mild autism even. And their British education is a fantastic support for those students as well. So we mustn't just think of British education as just for the very bright, but it's talented in other ways. And those with learning differences have huge skills and huge talents and abilities to offer as well. So to want to make that point too. Thank you. Uh, there's a question for you here, Mark, in the in the Q and A. It's just asking. Um, how will international schools like Charterhouse opening in Nigeria change the way Nigerian families view education options? I mean, do you have a view on how that would how that you see schools setting up overseas? It's quite a different proposition to coming to the UK for schooling, I'd imagine. But how do you read it? Well, I've been involved in the Charterhouse project for a year and a half, and I did the research feasibility study into the the launch of Charterhouse, and I drove past it on Friday, so it's, it's one I'm very familiar with. And I, I think we're talking about um, a, a population of 220 million and Lekki is going to be the fastest growing area in, in Lagos in itself. And so there's an, I don't think it's going to make much difference to the recruitment for UK boarding school, because there's always a demand for reasons I've explained for have a British education in Britain. But I'm very pleased that uh, Chant House is setting up as well to provide another option and provide a, a good quality education in Lagos as well. So there's a place for everybody. But I don't think the demand is just growing from all areas and the population is growing from all areas and the um, salaries are growing. So there's a room for everybody. OK, thank you, Mark. We're just coming towards uh, the end of this session, uh, this one hour, which has whizzed by. Uh, so I'd just like to come to each of our panellists for some closing thoughts or comments or things to leave the audience with perhaps Akin as sponsor of this session uh, I could come to you first for any closing thoughts as we start to wrap up so. oh yeah I suppose closing thoughts for me um hopefully I've not scared everyone off with um, all of our complicated um UK tax rules I mean they are complicated there's no question about it but um I think you touched on a really important point and that's that with planning um, you know, it goes from uh, being a problem to great opportunity. So proper planning, investing in UK property, having a plan for the ownership structure, the succession of that property means that you, you can do very well. Uh, planning means that you can get the necessary funds that you need to the UK in a tax efficient way. So that P word um, really does make a huge difference. And we have lots of clients come in planning properly and really everything just working out according to plan. That's the value of high quality independent advice, isn't it? So make, to make the complex navigable. Uh, Bimpe, any, any closing thoughts as we come to the end of this hour? Um, yes, definitely. I, I think from this um, sort of talk 
I think if people will be realized that every aspect of the planning also requires um, support from experts. So um, Mark's expertise, obviously, is second to none in helping you select the right school. Uh, they, but everything is linked from the tax implications and definitely when it comes to deciding what financial products or investments to make, please seek financial advice. There's always, you know, the risk to your capital. So you've got to make sure you, there's, it's not a DIY. So I'm hoping Thank that you. people will take a look from this session. Thank you. Uh, and Mark, well, I, I, I suggest we close in a second with the parent uh, testimonial that you provide, which is a fantastic little clip that I think we can end on. But any closing thoughts before we get to that? Yeah, the closing thought is I help families with the start of the process, but I don't just stop there. I help families through the whole of education of their children right up until they've graduated from university. And I keep in touch with them. This week I set a three-hour parents-teachers meeting with the family, and we keep in touch every single step of the way. And to lead into the video, I run three exhibitions a year in Lagos and Abuja. And we just returned from one a few weeks ago. And we interviewed a parent who gave her feedback on how she finds it useful to her as a parent in the search and process for choosing a boarding school. Fantastic. Well, look, thank you for joining us today. Do watch this uh, short video. Thanks to Buzzercop for sponsoring the session. I found it extremely useful, extremely useful. It's been an excellent opportunity, you know, for me to address my concerns as a mother, okay? As a mother, when you're letting your child go out to school in the UK, you're concerned not just about the curriculum, you're concerned about the atmosphere, you're concerned about the value system, you're concerned about, you know, the mothering stuff, who's there to nurture the, the child. You know, and I had an excellent opportunity to sit and meet with the school of choice. The beauty of it is every question was already expected, and so I could easily navigate around the answers and I found my comfort, I found my confidence as a matter of fact in taking the decision to let our child go on to the UK. Well thank you for joining us, thanks to the panel and I wish you a very good afternoon.